Yes. Okay, we should get started. My pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Doug Knight. Many of you probably know him. He did his PhD in Cornell. Uh, then he moved to Caltech for a postdoc. And then came back to Cornell as a professor. He's been a professor there for almost 20 years. Uh, he's done important work in uh, MHD, uh, compact objects, accretion things, and more recently in exoplanets and dynamics in general. Um, some of the works, <laughs> he, he won the uh, Sloan uh, in 98. Simon's Fellowship in Theoretical Physics uh, to continue working in extreme exoplanets. Today he will tell us how to misalign planets, this and rings. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. I hope not everybody is as expert as Yen Qing, uh, Christopher, Norm. Okay, there's some cosmologists, right? Are there? <laughs> Very good. Okay, good. So in the, it's always great pleasure to come back to CETA. I have a lot of friends here and uh, so many things going on at CETA. And uh, so, so indeed, I want to tell you uh, three small problems concerning related to misaligned planets and disks and rings. Uh, so all mechanics problems, and uh, some of them are a little bit tricky, but uh, most of them are quite straightforward, I think, <laughs> once you understand them. So the first problem concerns uh, binary, binary star disk and uh, stellar spin interactions that can possibly give rise to misaligned protoplanetary disk, meaning that the disk of the protostar may be misaligned with the spin axis of the protostar. So that's what I mean by misaligned protoplanetary disk. The second problem concerns the gradual secular perturbation of a binary companion acting on a giant planet, normally formed giant, giant planets, gradually uh, making the planet plunging into small, close distance to the central star and making it misaligned hot Jupiter. And finally, I'll talk about the problem concerning the extended misaligned disk and rings around planets and brown dwarfs. Okay? As you can see, all these problems share a common property, namely all, the, all, the, all of these related to the vectors chasing one another, giving rise to interesting features. Okay? Uh, so let me first uh, talk about misaligned planets. I think all of you, most of you are aware that one of the surprises in the era of exoplanets is that uh, many exoplanetary systems are misaligned, right? In the sense that the orbital axis of the planets, orbital angular momentum axis, angular momentum axis of planets are misaligned with the spin axis of the whole star. So here is, right? Here is the orbit. The orbital axis is here, the spin axis of the star is this, so they're misaligned, right? Um, okay, so there are like 80 or 90 systems that have been measured, right? Here are the spin orbit misalignment angle, uh, the function of orbital period. You can see many of them are indeed aligned, but some of them are, significant fraction of them are misaligned, and some of them are even retrograde, meaning that they're greater than 90 degrees, for example, okay? Uh, it's also worth noti noticing that uh, there are uh, at least one, at least one system, multi-planetary systems. So this particular system has two planets, 10, 10 day, 21 day orbits, two planets, both are transiting planets. And, uh, this, and this, 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 of course, these two planets are in the same plane because they're both transiting, but the spin axis of the whole star is misaligned with that orbital plane orbital axis, right? So, and this is measured by uh, seismology, oscillation of the star, okay? Uh, there may be other candidates, but it's not so clear yet, okay? So the question then is how do you produce this, uh, uh, how do you produce this misaligned planets, in particular hot Jupiter? Most of these misaligned systems are hot Jupiters. So there are three possibilities, broadly speaking, three possibilities. The first possibility is that Maybe the whole system, the, the disk, the protoplanetary disk are misaligned with the, with the protostar, protostar, right? The whole disk is misaligned. And therefore, you form a planet there and the disk migrate, for example. Of course, then in that case, the planets will be misaligned with the spin axis of star. So I call that primordial misalignment between the spin axis of star and the disk axis. Okay, that's the first possibility. So you might imagine this is misaligned, but you form planet either 
far away and then gradually migrate due to this driven migration, all form in situ, right? The second possibility is what we call the lead of cosine migration induced by a binary companion. So you, you form a giant planet at a few AU distance, but suppose you have a distant binary perturber, right? And then through the, through the gradual perturbation of the binary perturber, the planet can be gradually, can, can, you can make the planet gradually go into a small distance, eventually making a misaligned hot Jupiter, okay? And the third class is of mechanisms relies on planet-planet interactions. The, the idea being that you form not just one planet, but a few, two or three, or few planets. And over the time, these planets maybe interact with each other, either strong interaction, scattering, or gradual interactions. Over long time scales, eventually, one of the planets get, get pushed into the near vicinity of the star and misaligned. Okay, and uh, so these, there have been a lot of work done in this area. Some of the best work was done here, Yan the, 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 uh, just last week, the, this week, today, that paper by Cristobal. So I'm not going to say anything about this, okay? I'm also not going to say anything about observational constraints here, because they're the actually expert here. Uh, you, can, you can check some of the nice papers by Cristobal and uh, uh, Chelsea and Yan Qing. They're the th nice discussion of what current constraints on different, different uh, formation mechanism of hot Jupiter. So it's actually quite interesting that uh, hot Jupiters are the first class of exoplanets discovered, yet I think it's fair to say it's still quite confusing as to how you, what's the dominant channel uh, of their formation, how you form them. And uh, just in the last, last few years, it's become very confusing. And uh, it's fair to say that uh, all of these channels may contribute to some extent Right? Maybe this one is the most important, okay? And you can check some of these, uh, these papers, okay? Um, so all of this channel may contribute to some extent, okay? Okay, so what I'm going to talk about in the first, you know, 40 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes of the talk is to discuss both of these first two mechanisms, okay? And I'm not gonna say anything about this one for now, <laughs> all right? Okay, so, uh, how do you produce primordial misalignment between the disk and the uh, protostar? Okay. There are several ideas, several general ideas that have been put forward or suggested or studied. Um, the first one is simply that uh, the, when you look, think about star formation, star, star is forming a turbulent molecular cloud. The core, even the core region is sort of a, can be turbulent, right? You form lumps due to turbulent compression. So the, the gas that coming in into the protostar, newly formed protostar that assemble the disk, they come in different directions. So they have different directions of angular momentum. So, so in that picture, right, you would say, you know, it's very natural to expect when you assemble the disk, the disk coming, you know, they, they, they change in directions, right? The spin axis of the whole star is, de is determined by the cumulative effect of accretion of angular momentum from the disk. Whether if you think about formation, instantaneous orientation of the disk, that may be, may be changing direction. So when you form planets in the disk, you know, you would expect misalignment. So that's a, that's a general picture. The tricky thing here is one should think about is that when the disk change in directions, you know, because the turbulent, the falling in, the gas is falling in, coming in different directions. When you change the disk orientation, the star will, may, or, may or may not follow, right? The star orientation may change. You have to, there's a torque between the disk that's changing direction and the spin axis of star. You have to actually keep track of that also. So that, uh, that needs to be um, considered carefully, okay? So that's the first kind of ideas that have been put forward. The second possibility is that uh, uh, when you have a magnetic protostar, which we know protostar, the magnetic killer Gauss field is typical. When you have this coming in, impinging upon the magnetic star, there's a, there is, it turns out that the magnetic torque, mutual magnetic torque, interaction torque between this central star, which has magnetic field, and the disk, under some conditions, this torque tend to push the axis of the spin of the star and the disk away from each other. Okay, and that's a possibility, so I'll come back to this a little bit later in this talk. And finally, there's the, idea, this, there's the possibility of binary, right? So you form a protostar with a disk, the happily, the disk happily orbiting around the star. Suppose you have a binary companion, right? You, you form a star usually in binary systems, right? The binary 
tidal torque from the binary can act on the disk, can change the orientation of the disk. And, uh, and this, this may also give rise to misalignment. Okay, and this idea was first put forward by Constantin Bettigin, so we did some work on this, so I want to first talk about this uh, here. Okay, um, next, in the next 10 minutes or so. <laughs> All right, so, so here is the setup of the problem. We have a star here. It's a, you can see it's oblate, so it has a, it's because it's spinning, so it's, a, it's spinning axis here, S, is a spin axis of the star, right? It starts oblate. We have a disk. Wait, it. We have a disk here. So the disk initially may be aligned with that star. So I, I draw here. I draw this in a general orientation, the disk axis. But in, initially, this disk axis may be aligned with the with S. Okay. And then we have a binary far away, orbiting this photo star. So here is a binary axis. Okay. So that's a nice simple setup. Very simple, okay? So I'm going to, then the question, what's going to happen, right? So I'm going to make a drastic assumption that the disk behave like rigid body, okay? The whole, that's why I have only one axis here, right? This disk just is a, it's a plate. It's just rigid body, flat thing, has an has axis. So I'm going to assume that, okay? The disk behave like rigid body, so you may think this is ridiculous, but it's not so unreasonable if you think about it, because different regions of disk, they talk to each other, communicate with each other through various kind of forces. You could have bending waves, hydrodynamical forces, viscosity that communicate in different regions of the disk, or if the disk is massive enough, they could have self-gravity, they can sort of communicate with each other. The net effect is that they may behave like a rigid body, but that need to be checked. That need to be checked, okay? So for now, just assume that, okay? I'm just going to do the simplest thing first. Rigid plate, right? So I have a disk axis here. Oh my God, okay. Uh, uh, okay, anyway, so here's my disk axis here. Here is my binary axis, so this is cut off. All right, so what's going to happen? Well, of course, you all know what's going to happen. The, the, the tidal torque from the binary is going to act on the disk. It's going to make the disk precess, right? It's going to make the disk precess around this binary axis. LD of the disk is going to precess around the binary axis at the rate omega PD, precession of the disk. That rate, you can easily, with a freshman or you know, sophomore level of physics, you can easily calculate that torque, that, that precession rate, and that rate uh, depends on the mass of the binary perturber, depends on the size of the disk, of course, depends on how far away the binary is. AB is a binary separation, right? So I'm taking a typical number, so you know, 50 AU disk, we have a binary at 300 AU. So it's a sort of canonical, quote, canonical numbers, not, nothing ridiculous, uh, nothing, okay? And the precession rate is, uh, you know, precession period is about a fraction of million years or so. Okay, so, okay, so now the disk will process, try to process around, around the binary axis. So therefore, if S, the spin axis of the whole star is, is initially aligned with the LD, as, as this guy deviates, move away, of course, S will be misaligned with LD. So S will try to process with LD. Why? Because the star is spinning, so it has, it's oblate, so there's a torque, interaction torque between the disk and the quadrupole of the star, right? So that's a, also a very simple thing, right? So anytime you have this disk which is misaligned with the oblate-shaped star, there will be mutual torque between them. And that torque is going to drive S into precession around LD, right? Of course, it's a mutual precession, but typically, if you check the numbers, typically you find that the LD is much larger. The magnitude of the disk angular momentum is much larger. So basically what you're talking about is S precessing around LD. All right. Um, so that precession rate you can also calculate very easily, right? It will depend on the mass of the disk. Depends on how fast the star is rotating because uh, the precession rate depends on the oblate shape of the star, so that depends on the, that, that depends on the rotation, how fast the star is rotating. 
it depends on the inner radius of the disk, you know, how, how far the disk extends into the central region of the star, right? And depends on the size of the disk a little bit. What mass, what mass are you taking to this? Yeah, this one is R to the minus one, I think, kind of, you know, so the, the, the law will change, this, this power law will change a little bit. Out of the minus one, yeah. And uh, yes, this is do the simplest thing. In reality, of course, you could have a non-homologous shape and <laughs> things. Um, so something we have to consider. Uh, so here is another number. So it's, uh, you can see you know, the precession period of S around the LD. It's about uh, you know, 10 to 5 years or so. It's less than that. OK, so here it's what I have told you. right? We have these three vectors binary axis, which is fixed. The binary has a lot of angular momentum. LB is fixed. I have a disk angular momentum axis, LD. I have a spin axis of the central star. So what I told you already is that this disk will precess around LB, right? And then, of course, whenever LD and it is misaligned with S, S will try to precess around, around LD. So you have two precession period, precession rates. Right? So this guy is running around this guy here like this, and this S is trying to run around this guy. Okay, so that's a very simple problem. So the question is, what's going to happen? Well, you mentioned already there could be magnetic torques. So Later on, yeah. Come, uh, just, right now, it's just pure, pure gravity. Oh, so the order of magnitude, they're comparable, smaller? Um, so the torque they are They're still smaller, depending on the parameters. I'll come back to that thing. Can I come back to this? Let's do the simple things first. The pure gravity. So far, it's pure gravity so far. It's simple, but is it the leading order of turn? It, I think so. Yeah, it is. It is. OK, it is. OK. <laughs> yeah. The pure gravity, no magnet, no equation. You want to do the simple things first, then I add complications. OK? And then you can. Well, but you want to start with the things that are biggest. I think this is the biggest. <laughs> OK, fine. If you have binary companion, I don't think that. OK? All right, so this, this is a simple problem, right? This uh, three vectors chasing, you know, this guy ch moving around there and this guy moving around. So the question is, what's going to happen? Can this follow LD, right? Uh, what's going to happen this, to this axis? Well, there are two limiting cases that are very simple to consider without doing any calculations, right? The first limiting case is that if this rate is much larger than this rate, Right, so I call this kids chasing an adult. So here the adult is running at this rate, running this very slowly. The kids is running around this adult. It's very fast. Then, of course, no matter how do I have kids, no matter how, how I move, they're always in my orbit. So, it's always, so in that limit, this, no matter how this LD chain is processing, but this S will always follow. Makes sense, right? Because it's moving very fast. So in that case, this angle is not going to change. This angle between S and disk is not going to change. Right? So, so that's what I mentioned earlier. Right? It's, it's not enough to just say, you know, you can change the disk orientation, give you a misalignment. You have to think about whether the star can follow. Right? So in this limiting case, disk is changing orientation, but the stars can follow. You, cannot, you, you will not generate misalignment. Okay? So some of these earlier work, they missed this thing. It's a very simple thing. Okay? In the other limiting case, where the adult, this guy is moving very fast compared with the kids moving around, then in that case, of course, cannot follow, right? In that case, if this guy, this kid's very smart, will just recognize that uh, you know, this guy is moving around so fast. The kids were just chasing. We're not going to chase it. We're going to just more, more around the LB. So in that limit, the angle between S and B will be constant. Because you know, kids recognize this. There's a center, sort of center of mass, center of axis of this motion of LD. So the kids will just move around it like this. Right? So that's another limiting case. It's very simple. Right? So now the look at, let's look at the number again I gave you earlier. So here are the typical numbers. Right? Uh, what you, so what I did here is that uh, the disk mass I normalized to 0.1 solar stellar mass, which is sort of high end, earlier phase of the proto, proto, planet, proto stellar disk phase. In that earlier phase, you see that uh, this number, absolute value, is actually larger than this. So what happens is that earlier in the lifetime of the proto planet disk, when you first form, you are in the regime where this is very fast. 
But later on, as you, the disk mass gradually depleted, get depleted due to accretion, evaporation, this number will go down. The disk mass will go down. So at some point, these two numbers will cross each other, right? Will cross uh, on time scale a million years. And when these two things cross, you might get, when these two frequency cross, you might get something going to happen. And indeed, uh, your guess is correct if you actually do this calculation. Right, so here is the uh, time, here are the two frequencies in a very simple model, right? Uh, where you find, it, for example, in, uh, uh, the disk mass decreases. Right? Initially, you are in the regime where the, the kit is moving very fast, right? <laughs> and later on, you are in the other regime. When the thing cross, something dramatic can happen. So here are the just look at the, let's see, just look at the S and D, so the green, okay? So here the setup is that I have initially T equals zero, I have three axes, LB, LD, and, L and S. All of those three of them are within five degrees of each other. Okay, so all three axes are almost aligned within five degrees, right, initially, five degrees. So initially, in the adiabatic regime, this, you know, it stays five degrees, a little bit, more or less. But when this thing cross, suddenly you get a big angle. This green curve suddenly become a big angle is produced. <laughs> now, of course, you can say, oh, resonance. It's kind of, it's of something resonance happening. It's clearly the resonance, right? But it's kind of still very strange, you know, how you get big angle out of very small angles, right? It's three axes, still cannot. I don't know, maybe, I, hard to think about it, <laughs> actually, I find. Even though it's very simple, this, right? The three, you have three axes that are all within five degrees of each other, but somehow they, you, somehow you produce a big angle, okay? And uh, it's due to resonance. But how do you think about it? So here's something that you can think about it. The way to think about it, I, I, I like the way this way of thinking about it, okay? Uh, so why the resonance can give you such a big angle out of a small angle? So here's the way you can think about, right? Here is the equation that tells you that S is processing around LD at the rate omega PS. This is just mathematical translation of that sentence. S is processing around LD at this rate, right? The only thing that's different is that LD itself is changing in time. LD is, <laughs> right, have three axes. LD is changing, around, processing around LB. So this is a function of time. So, so the way to think about this is you can go to the rotating frame where this is, you know, this LD is processing on LB. You can go to the rotating frame where, you know, rotating at that rate of the precession of LD, right? Go to, in the rotating frame, in the rotating frame, in that fr at this rate, right? So you can go back to your rigid body mechanics. You, know, you go to the time derivative of the change, right? So, so if you write the equation in the rotating frame, you have this term, but you add a new piece here. <laughs> this is just calling the transformation. And you find that in the, if you view this dynamics of S in this rotating frame, you find S is processing around this vector at this certain rate. Okay, so, right? Uh, in this rotating frame, of course, because I'm in the rotating frame, LB and LS, oh, sorry, LB and LD are fixed, right? Because I'm in the already, it's fixed. So LD and LB are fixed. Good, so this is easy to, easy to visualize. So now you can see something magic can happen if these two numbers, if these two numbers are equal, right? Because, because you can see that, you know, I have LD here, LB here, they're almost aligned, right? If these two are equal, you have this, this, this rotation axis, which is different, it's a, it's a difference between LD minus LB. So it's basically this guy. So, so if you have S vector, which is like this, S, S is, is not processing around this guy. It, it's this thing. So you get, so that's the magic of getting big number out of small number. Right, so this, because this, uh, this, uh, this, this new axis is actually perpendicular, now, so you get, you get a huge angle. Uh, so that's, uh, that's um, it's, uh, it's still hard to 
if you want to tell uh, just high school kids, you know how to explain why you get big angle out of small angle. Is it? But anyway, so it's, uh, this is sort of the best I have. I have. Anyway, so that's the resonance. Uh, okay, so it's called a secular spin orbit resonance. Okay. So when the system crosses that resonance uh, during the evolution of the protoplanetary disk, you have now that your angular momentum and your disk and your boundaries are somehow similar, so it must be a different. These rates, resonance occur when these two rates are equal, the omega are the same. So in that case, but the. If, you, if your angular momentum is completely dominated by your binary, no, that's a unit vector. Unit vector, sorry, yeah. Hat means unit vector, yeah. So they have unit vectors, so, so yeah. Uh, so, so okay, so that's why you can get a big angle out of small angle, right? When, you, when the system naturally crosses the resonance. Um, but I said earlier, if you look at the number, it's uh, pretty natural. You can actually happen. I mean, you can derive the condition under which it can happen. It's not so, you don't have to fine tune the things. This is naturally come out. You can cross the resonance, okay? Uh, at least in the simplest model, right? Um, all right, so now let's say a few words about the complications. <laughs> Accretion, the other, we actually have a disk which is accreting onto the portal star, and the star actually has a magnetic field. And this is no longer a clean problem. Um, here it's the canonical picture of how this accretion works with the magnetic, I'm not considering the magnetic wind coming from the star, impinging upon the disk. Uh, um, Chris has some, some, done some work on these things. So. But here's a canonical picture of how this equation works. This coming in from far away onto the magnetic star, right? The star has a dipole field, right? As the gas coming closer, the equation disk get disrupted by the magnetic stress, and that truncation radius is, so, is called a magnetosphere radius, and that radius depends on the field, strength of the field, depends on the equation rate, and so on, right? And when the, when the disk get truncated, you have Christian flow funneled, get funneled onto the, along the field line onto the pole, magnetic pole of the star. And that's how, the, they also the textbook picture how this equation works. Right? The details, of course, is very complicated. Right? Um, so, right, so let's look at the torque, right, or the magnitude um, acting on the star, right, acting on the star. The first torque, of course, if you have a question, you know, m dot acting on the, you know, quit onto the star, you have a torque which is, uh, you know, m dot times the specific angular momentum of the gas, of the quitting gas, evaluated at the inner radius, truncation radius of the disk. That's all the magnitude, right? Um, so that certainly will be there, right? And this torque, this torque, of course, tend to align S and L, right? You have a disk which is, this direction, the spin is this. You, when you accrete, of course, they, they try to align. This, this torque tend to align. Tend to align the S and, and the S and the disk and LD, right? Or the magnitude. Um, now, if you evaluate this for typical number to answer normal question, um, the, the time scale, I don't have a number. If you, you can estimate the time scale, how fast this torque is changing the spin, angular momentum of the, uh, angular momentum of the star divided by that torque. That torque is a million years or so. So it's a little bit longer, but not too much. It's comparable. It's a few times longer. So it's, a, it's not a dominant thing, but it's certainly not a negligible thing. Okay? Um, so that's EV, automatically wise. Then there is also, in general, when you have a disk coming closer to the star, get truncated, the star has a dipole field. There is a, the dipole field is going to induce magnetic current in the disk, and that current will interact with the dipole field, and there will be a mutual torque between them, right? So this clearly is complicated, depending on the model. There's decades of research on these things. Uh, but all the magnitude-wise, it's going to be, not so surprisingly, it's going to be mu squared divided by R in cube, right? Because, right, basically it's a, you know, you have a mu, essentially mu times, it's mu times mu over R in cube. Why? Because this guy here is the field produced by the dipole on the disk, and the disk get induced respond, producing some field which feed back on the dipole. So that's sort of the torque you would naively expect. There may be some coefficient, depending on how they couple. So that's all the magnitude you would expect, mu squared times uh, 
uh, this is a mutual torque between the disk and the star, right? All right, so this torque has a component that actually give you misalignment, okay? So let me, this, um, I don't, um, okay, I, I'm not going to go back <laughs> to the detail, but this, why it's misaligned can be understood essentially a laboratory experiment, called laboratory experiment. It's essentially that this Faraday disk, if you have Faraday disk between a magnet, Usually you have to put a strong axis here to hold this thing together, but if you release this thing, take away, imagine you're doing this uh, space shuttle, what you're gonna find is that this, this plate is gonna be tumble. There's an instability, tumbling instability thing, right? So namely if you make it tumble a little bit, it will tumble more. So that's, that's why it's, uh, it's, it's, you can check this, uh, you can do that yourself, it's, uh, it's actually misalignment, okay? So, so anyway, you have these two torques. Um, it turns out these two torques actually have, have the same order of magnitude. Name why? Because you actually evaluate, the, evaluate this torque at, you know, you have used R in. The R in, the inner radius of the disk, is determined by balance between gas ram pressure, kinetic pressure of the gas, and magnetic pressure. So that's magnetosphere radius. If you evaluate this torque at this, using this inner radius, you find these two torques are actually the same order of magnitude. That makes the problem, unfortunately, it's, <laughs> You know, it's uh, the same order magnitude. Okay, so that's where the uncertainty uncertainty lie. Basically, you, I, I'm not sure which one wins. Unfortunately, the, the detailed balance between these two things depends on the details how you treat the magnetic disk interactions. Okay, but the reason I want to point it out is that there's some misconceptions in some recent papers. If you look at this formula, you can get naive impression that well, if you have a star which is, you know. For example, massive T Tauri star, for example, there's an observation that massive T Tauri stars, say with mass greater than 1.3 solar mass, actually have a weaker dipole field than less massive solar type stars. So you might say, oh, well, this guy, therefore this guy is weaker, and therefore they may have some, may give you a difference, may give rise difference between low mass star and massive stars. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, know is that there is a puzzle in the misalignment problem. Namely, it's been observed that that the, if you look at solar type star versus slightly more massive star, there's a difference in the misalignment property in the sense that more massive star tend to be more misaligned and uh, low mass star tend to be aligned. There's a puzzle exactly how he explains this. Uh, so what I want to say here is not so obvious because you cannot just, cannot just look at this. You have to look at both. They actually compete against each other. So that's all I want to say here. So it's, uh, this two talk that you're comparable. Uh, so which one wins is not clear, okay? And uh, it's certainly not say, oh, well, B field is larger, therefore it's much, much bigger. So it's uh, have a big dramatic effect. That uh, can be, it's more subtle than that. Okay, so let me go back to this, uh, finish this. Let me go back to the, oh, let me go back to the star disk binary interaction problem, right? I have three vectors chasing each other, right? Now you can add, at least in a parameterized way, the accretion and magnetic torques into the picture. Okay, I'm not going to, you can, it's complicated, but you can add it in the parameterized way. Um, what I would say is that magnetic accretion, magnetic accretion, magnetic field can either damp or increase the SL spin orbit angle, but does not change the picture. You still have this resonance encounter, you know, this uh, system involved is still there, okay? Um, so that's all I want to say about the first part of the talk, right? Uh, so, so here's a summary. With a binary companion, spin disk misalignment can be easily, quote, easily generated if you have a binary companion, right? And the key is the resonance crossing. So I explained what's the resonance in this context. And the uh, Christian magnet torque can affect it but not diminish the effect. And uh, uh, so this is what I call, is one of the ways of producing primordial misalignment between the protoplanetary disk and the protostar. Now I'm a little worried about this because it seems too robust. It seems it's too robust because you don't need, uh, unlike, you know, you just need to three, three vectors, even, you don't have to be very misaligned. Initially, the all three vectors can be more or less aligned and you naturally cross the resonance. You can produce large number and uh, it seems it's a little too robust. And of course, I'm hiding a lot of complications here. For example, I sh one of the obvious things is that uh, I assume that this is a rigid plate. That may or may not be so, <laughs> may not be so so great. Okay, and, okay. So this may be warped, and of course the planets embedded in the disk. What? How does the planet behave when the disk 
changing orientation, right? And this is something we are still working on. And, uh, and also, of course, the disk evolution is complicated. It may not evolve in the homologous way. You may produce a hole at the central region, right, due to evaporation or due to the wind that the Chris was doing, uh, the photo uh, stellar wind. Get rid, of the, get rid of the inner region of the disk. So that can introduce a lot of messy complications. Okay. Um, So yes, here I'm, of course, I'm assuming everything's coupled. The disk, internal stress, internal torque, that couple different region is very much stronger than the torque from the spin of the star acting on the inner region of this. So, how far are you from that? Uh, so, keep just well, the innermost ring. If you have a bending wave, if you have an effective bending wave, we looked at this, it seems to be very effective. If you have a you have a you know puffy disk, relatively puffy h over r greater than alpha, you have an effective propagation of bending wave. Then it's effective, right? <laughs> but if you have a become very tenuous that in the region, then you have to worry about it. Uh, not not so much mass. Yeah. So if you have a well, the mass get depleted very quickly, then this story may change. Okay, wow, okay. Uh, anyway, so let me move on quickly to the second topic. <laughs> All right, so uh, I think uh, I'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, so this is a formation of hot Jupiter through lead off cosine migration uh, in binary. This is a work that uh, I mean, uh, this particular scenario actually was pioneered by people here, Norm and uh, Yan Qin, uh, and then some of the best work was done by, by Cristobal. And uh, so you can ask them the details. Uh, so um, I told Yan Qin I'm still trying to catch up with Yan Qin. We're 15 years behind, <laughs> 10 years behind. <laughs> anyway, so we're, I'll tell you what we're, we've been doing with these things, OK? A uh, little bit. So let me just quickly, so this is the second scenario, how you form hot Jupiter. Um, Okay, so here's the lead of cosine oscillation. Um, I'm not sure whether I, sh I should. Uh, you know, some of you know this very well, but <laughs> maybe I should. All right, here's the setup. I have a star here. I have a planet at a few AU distance, All right? All right, and I have a binary companion far away. So I have planet orbital axis and spin axis, uh, binary axis, right? And uh, the cosine, lead of cosine effect refers to the fact that um, if the inter inclination angle, initial inclination angle i is greater than 40 degrees, the circular orbit is unstable. It can become eccentric. In fact, if the inclination is large enough, sufficiently large, this, this, you have this eccentricity of the planets and the inclination is undergoing co correlated oscillation. Right? So you see the inclination angle oscillate and correlated with eccentricity oscillation. If that inclination angle, initial inclination is large enough, you can go to very high eccentricity. Okay, so that's the, the standard lead off cosine oscillation. Um, I want to s spend two slides, talk about some technical <laughs> things of octopo effect. So these are the, some special uh, for the expert. Uh, so what I told you here, it's a standard sort of lead off cosine quadrupole level oscillation where you only take into account of the quadrupole effect, quadrupole potential of the binary perturbo acting on the binary. And of course, uh, for those people who work in this field, know in the last few years there have been a lot of discussion on the octopole effect, right? High order effect of the potential acting on the binary, right? Uh, octopole. And what has been pointed out is that when you have include octopole effect, the you can you don't even you don't need a very inclined orbit to make a large eccentricity. Eccentricity can be very large even when the inclination is modest, okay? And you can also change the orientation of this, flip the spin, uh, binary axis, binary orbital axis. What has not been, uh, in all this case, not been appreciated, some, at least for some of the papers, and when they discuss, they get carried away by the flipping. I mean, the, is that the, this lead of course, the oscillation is a fragile thing. You have, rely on more or less clean binary perturbation. You have bi planet here, you have a very clean thing there, sitting there, orbiting. If you have any short range forces that affect the orbit of the planets, by short range forces, I mean, for example, general relativity or tidal interactions between the planets and the things, that can screw up the oscillation. When you include that, the maximum eccentricity is limited. And a lot of times the flip, so-called flip, it's, it's suppressed. Okay, so there's actually a nice, so this, this, 
you, with octopole, you don't go to very high, uh, go to arbitrary high eccentricity. There's still a limiting eccentricity you can get. And that, so here is a complicated plot. Uh, I just want to draw attention to, for example, this. Look at the green line. Here's the green line. So here is the maximum eccentricity, 1 minus E max, as a function of inclination, initial inclination, right? So the green line refers to the pure quadrupole problem, quadrupole result. Right, so you see, if the inclination is greater than 40 degrees, the maximum eccentricity will become, you know, be develop eccentricity. If you go to 90 degrees, you go to higher eccentricity, higher eccentricity, maximum eccentricity. Right, but not arbitrarily high. It's uh, you know, there's a limit you can go. Right, you, there's a limit you can go. Right, that limit is set by the short range forces. Okay, now when you add octopole effect you get this blue curve, right? The blue curve. The interesting thing is that this blue curve is still limited by the same limiting eccentricity which you can calculate analytically. Not arbitrary value, you can, there's still limiting eccentricity. The only thing that octopole high order effect does is to widen the window of the extreme eccentricity. You know, make it, you know, you don't have to, you cannot go to arbitrary high eccentricity, you can, but you make it a window larger. Okay, and uh, so that's uh, actually, I'm not going to talk about it, have time, but. Um, this is uh, the blue curve, it's, it's plotting the maximum eccentricity the planet can get as a function of incarnation, initial incarnation. For random setting down some arguments This is not random, actually, we choose a fixed one, certain value, yeah, yeah, this is zero. Uh, widen this window. So it's not you can go to arbitrary high. You have to include the short range force. This maximum eccentricity can, can be calculated. And this is actually important for understanding some of these uh, analytically, the, uh, the migration fraction that we discuss. Uh, we probably don't have time to discuss, but, but this is a, okay. Okay, let me go back to the, let me go back to the hot Jupiter formation story that, uh, that uh, first, right? So planets form a few AU distance. You have binary stars periodically pump the planets into high E orbit. It's called the Lidov cosi, right? And then once you, the planet is in high eccentricity orbit, tidal dissipation in the planets will, will drain orbital energy, right? Will dissipate orbital energy, and therefore the orbit will circulate, eventually make, making a hot Jupiter. Right? That's how. That's a scenario, right? And uh, so what we have been doing in the last two years, it's uh, what, ask the question, what's going to happen to the spin axis of the star? So uh, the planet undergoing lead of cosine oscillation, doing these crazy things, what's going to happen to the spin axis of the star, right? So this is what we've done with two graduate students, uh, for, uh, Natalia Storch, who graduated last year, and uh, we have a couple of papers looking at the spin dynamics uh, in conjunction with orbit, orbit evolution, and uh, there's another recent paper looking at the analytical way of understanding this, uh, this problem. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the okay, so let me just tell you the story. Okay, so it's very, it's, you're gonna see, you're gonna see this very quite similar to the, the disk problem I just talked about, right? So here, right, you have a planet orbiting around the star, right? It's an eccentric orbit, right? It's going to the star, it's spinning, so it's oblate, so the planet can drive the star into precession. DS of the star, it's precessing around L of the planets, right? And that precession rate depends on mass of the planets, depends on the quadruple moment of the star, therefore the rotation rate of the star, and so on, right? Okay, depends on the orbital, orbital semi-major axis of the planet, and eccentricity of the planets. So spin-orbit coupling, all right? And so S will precess, precess around L at that rate. But I have already told you during the lead of cosine oscillation, L, L is not fixed. L is actually changing, right? L is actually doing crazy things. L is actually doing two things. One is actually doing precession around LB, but also undergoing mutation, right? This is the lead of cosine oscillation of the incarnation, right? Um, so the question is, just like the problem, the disk problem, can S keep up with L? Because that, that's the crucial question if you want to generate misalignment between S and L, right? That's the key thing, right? Can, can you do this? Well, now you get that. 
the answer depends on the relative rate. So you have this rate, and this rate, you have to compare these two rates. Uh, so here's a, uh, so, okay, right, I can do this very fast now. So if you have a rate where this spin precession is much larger than this, then the, the question, the answer is yes, right? The, the red is spin, the blue is orbit, so you can see the orbit is changing, but S is always following. It's not surprising, okay? In the other regime, you don't, right? You don't, right? The S is doing this thing, but L, sorry, sorry, the blue is doing these crazy things very fast, but the, but the red, which is the spin axis, is just going to, not going to follow it. Instead, it's just going to follow this binary axis, you can see, right? And in between, of course, it's complicated, <laughs> surprisingly. And here is a little cartoon. Natalia generated this thing. Uh, you can see the, it's all over the place. You're starting with aligned systems. So initially, blue and red are aligned, but now you can see they're all over the place. Angle. OK, and uh, so it is chaotic. Indeed, you can check the apple, the apple of time is a million years. And um, OK. Um, um, the problem is actually quite rich in terms of dynamics, uh, right? Uh, so the, the reason it's more complicated than the previous problem, a disk problem I talked to you earlier, is that these two frequencies are not, it's actually a quite rather erratic function of time. Both the precession frequency of the spin and the precession frequency of the orbit are strong function of eccentricity. So it's a strong function of time. So, so, it's, so this thing can get a little bit crazy, okay? And uh, the, the key parameter, that control the problem, it control the behavior of the system, is actually this ratio evaluated at zero eccentricity, right? So it's depending on the mass of the planet, spin rate of the star, and so on. Okay? And you can do fun things to give me a short of time. You can do, let me just show you this, this one, because it's sort of like, it's kind of nice. Uh, uh, I remember many years ago, some years ago, I was just asked Norm about some chaotic dynamics. I know nothing about. Uh, Norm said, you should read Lieberman. What's this, this, what's this book? This, this book is very hard for me to read anyway. But I gradually learned a little bit more. A little bit, uh, OK, anyway. Uh, anyway, here, here is a bifurcation diagram you can actually do. Right? So here, uh, you give you a system parameter, a set of parameters. Right? So give a mass of planets, everything else being the same. So for two solar mass, you run the system. Right, the, op the system, the planet undergoing lead of quasi oscillation for let's say, fifteen hundred cycles. The, the orbit is doing these things every time when the when the when the system reach maximum eccentricity, you record the spin axis direction, record the angle, and so you record a points in this diagram, spin orbit angle. So you can see that if you choose, for example, three solar, three Jupiter mass, you get all over the place. The angle is over the place. That's a sign of non-periodicity. It's completely chaotic. But if you choose some other, happen to choose another mass, let's say 4 point something, 4.5, you see you always come back to the same thing. So it's, it's kind of nice. Uh, this is a purely thing. Yeah, no dissipation, no dissipation. No dissipation, yes. Three body system plus a spin, plus spin. OK, so the periodic. Periodic, so here that you have periodic, this is called chaotic, but there's a periodic island. And uh, so anyway, that's kind of fun. And uh, if you add tidal dissipation, the question is what, what's going to happen to it? You can, the answer is yes. Oops, what happened? Oh, crashed. What? Okay, uh, why is that? What did I, I didn't do anything. <laughs> you didn't like me to, oh. Yeah, it's too chaotic. It's too chaotic. Anyway, so let me maybe start. Restart again. And uh, so I have ten minutes, right? More, five minutes? Few minutes. Okay. So let me skip this thing. So let me let me just uh, let me skip this. <laughs> uh, let me go to the if I can. Oh. Go to the, go to the last part of the talk. <laughs> <There you look. laughs> uh, okay. Uh, what happened? What the heck?
Okay. Um, if I can do this. What? Oh. I don't know what happened. Okay. Let me just do this old-fashioned way. Let me just jump. OK, anyway. Um, yeah, well, the, there's a memory. There's a memory of the things, OK? Uh, it matters somewhat, OK? Uh, so we ha actually, the, here's a sli the slide. We actually done quite a bit of theory of these things, so uh, how you understand the origin of the chaos and how the how the memory works, okay? And uh, there's some fun theory we did, and uh, okay, so let me, clearly too much stuff in this talk. It's not good, not good. Okay, let me, let me summarize this, <laughs> okay? And then I go on to the few minutes on the last topic. Okay, um, but I think it's fine. Basically, you, I think the key idea for people who don't work on these things is that, uh, you know, this, this the, the disk can change, the planet orbit x can change, but you have to worry about how the spin change, follow, right, these kind of things. And the spin dynamics can be chaotic, and this can be understood from the resonance overlap. So I did learn resonance overlap, that kind of stuff. <laughs> stuff. Uh, so migration, this migration can actually be calculated analytically, migration fraction. And uh, so let me now, in the last few minutes, talk about some, some recent thing, just, just new thing we are trying to, we're submitting in probably next, this week, next week. Okay, and this concerns the extended inclined disk and ring around planet brown dwarf. And this is a simple, really simple problem, actually, quite simple problem compared to the previous one. Okay, so the motivation for this, 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 this paper, it's, uh, it's this system. So a few years ago, Eric Mamajak and uh, collaborators discovered a strange light curve, very strange light curve. J1407, which is a young pre-main sequence star, about one solar mass, right? And uh, they find this strange light curve, right? So you see this, uh, there's a series of eclipses lasting about 60 days around, this is, this is centered around the April 2007. And there are a lot of these dips, okay? <laughs> and a big, tip, uh, big eclipse. And there are symmetric patterns, sort of they claim the symmetric pairs, smaller amplitude. It's not completely random, okay? So they tried different, they tried to explain this with several possibilities. In the end, they come up to the conclusion that most likely this light curve, maybe this strange light curve may be due to a large ring systems around un unseen planets and the brown dwarf. We don't know the, they haven't seen the companion. Right, but there's deep observation by the collab one of the collaborators in these papers. It is a, it's a substellar, certainly substellar. So it could be brown dwarf or giant planets. Okay. All right, and uh, so that's their interpretation. There's a YouTube video where they produced in the recent paper. They <laughs> producing this light curve using ring a series of ring systems, and the ring has gaps, and maybe due to moon. So there's a you know, news article, or these kind of things. Okay. Um, so the claimed, in order to produce this big duration, the ring has to be very big, right? So 0.6 AU. And uh, the orbital period of these systems, maybe just orb the thing orbiting around it, maybe 10 years, 30 years, maybe even eccentric, okay? Um, so here's uh, the things. Uh, I think it's fair to say it's still under debate whether this is true, but it's, uh, my attitude is not completely random. There are some systematic things. There's a lot of data points here. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, so, so, so it's intriguing observation, okay? So there's a lot of questions you can ask about the systems, whether you believe it or not, right? Um, so discovery of exo rings, exo moons, and these things. So, so a lot of questions you can ask. So the question we're trying to ask is, and he gave a talk recently at Cornell, that's what, we start working on these things, right? Um, Eric gave a talk. Um, so the question is, under what conditions can you have a very extended large ring or disk around 
a planet or brown dwarf, right? Um, so you can, a lot of questions. First question is, well, of course, this is very extended. What do I mean? Of course, the ring has to be less than a fraction of the hill radius. The hill radius being the region, being the radius of the region where the ring is confined, gravitationally bound or confined by the planets. Right? You, this is, can be easily satisfied. So when I say extended, it means like it's a comp, you know, fraction of this, not, not 10 to minus 3 Rh. But it's, so you, can, you have these kind of things. So in principle, it's OK. Right? When you form a, you know, imagine how you form this ring, this disk, circumplanetary disk, through embedded in certain stellar disk, they can, the ring can be, the disk can be, can be rather extended in principle. The other question, of course, is how do you produce misalignment uh, incarnation? To have eclipse, you have to have inclined disk. The, the ring has been inclined relative to the orbital plane, right? Otherwise, you don't get this kind of things, right? Now, producing this incarnation, of course, is a whole different story. In the case of Saturn's ring, it's inclined by 27 degrees or so. It's due to some resonance. It's been orbit resonances. So in this case, how you do it, it's a different story. Um, so let me not, let's not go into there. So the question we try to address is that how do you maintain, suppose somehow you produce the thing, how do you maintain this incarnation? Right? So here again is the setup we have. So I like those vectors. So all these things, right? I uh, have a planet here, right? Planet is spinning, so it has oblate shape, so S. Right? And I have a star, in this case. Stars orbiting around the planets, well, orbiting around each other, L orbit. And I have rings, not just one ring, but many rings with a, characterized by radius. So it's, each radius has, a, has orientation L hat. Right? And uh, so the question is, uh, you want to get misalignment, L between L and L orbit. OK? Um, how do you do these things? Well, the this may not be so obvious because the, the, problem is, uh, the problem is that this ring at radius r experience torques from the, from, well, <laughs> experience two torques from the system. The first torque is that the ring is orbiting around the planets. There's a star sitting there, right? The, 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 there's a torque from the star acting on the ring. That's just this, right? But of course, the ring is also experiencing torque from the planets because the planets oblate at J2. It's, 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 a, it's an oblate thing. So another torque, right? So both torque is trying to twist. Both torque are trying to twist the ring, right? right? And there is a special place where these two compete against each other. And that, that's called Laplace radius. By equating this, you get Laplace radius, OK? Yes. Wrap up. Okay. So good, good. Okay. So let me let me do this thing. So the 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 the, the upshot is that this two torque in steady state will try to, if you have dissipation, the system will. The system will reach a steady state. The steady state is such that, at the inner region of the disk, the inner region of the disk, it's of the ring, it's experiencing a lot of torque from the planets, so it's going to be aligned with the planets, axis. In outer region will be aligned with is experiencing a lot of torque from the star, therefore will be aligned with the orbits. So this is called the Laplace surface. For people who work on this, know this very well. But you can see what happens is that in steady state, this can be the outer region of the disk can be aligned with the will be aligned with the orbit. So it's not going to produce eclipse, right? So the question is how do you how do you make the disk sufficiently rigid? To have sufficient misalignment in the most in the outer region of the disk, so there are several ways to do this. One is using internal stress, another is using self gravity. Okay, so the upshot is that uh, you once you have in the ring, you don't have a lot of internal stress. The pressure is negligible, but if you have sufficient self gravity, you can do it in principle. So here we have a modified Laplace surface, including self gravity. So if you put in enough mass in the ring, the orientation of the ring as a function of radius is such that in the outer region of the disk can produce sufficiently misalignment. Okay, so we have this generalized Laplace surface, uh, including self gravity, and um, when it's, when the system is not in equilibrium, you can do similar kind of things. There are some interesting dynamics of this system. So let me here is a summary. So uh, that particular system is rather intriguing. 
I'm not sure whether I believe it actually, but uh, it puts some interesting constraint on on what to what extent the ring has to have mass has to have in order to have this kind of observable signature incline inclination and transit. Okay, the conclusion is that the ring has to be sufficiently massive, but not too massive. So we have a quantitative. What, So they have 20%. So, so they have, that's a rough number. They have, they need a, so, so you can see, so disk mass. Yeah, so you, you need something, so, so it's not arbitrary. So you need some certain mass. The disk the ring has to have certain mass in order to be sufficiently rigid. So that different region of the disk coupled to each other maintain this rigidity and therefore producing eclipse. Okay, so sorry over time. Thank you, thank you very much. Model that is used to fit the flat disk. Yeah, they assume flat disk. Yeah, at least you need what they, you need if you need a, a big region of the disk, not all the place, right? You need a big region of the disk to be reasonably flat. I mean, if it's not by improving, you cannot fit the eclipse. They didn't try that, of course. They did not try. They did not try. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, for very large data, exactly. Yes, you need. Plasma contour in that case can produce remarkable, you know, windows and, yeah. and, and, and uh, yeah. opaque uh, yeah. bases. And so I'd be surprised that you couldn't make some progress, but who knows how you could Who knows, it. yes. Maybe, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they didn't try. Ask, ask me, they didn't try this thing. So what you need, you do need a large region, reasonably large region to be reasonably flat, right? If you I mean, if you're not, then you, their fitting is completely incorrect, so you have to redo the thing. So that's all, all we're saying. You know, so. Why can't you replace uh, radial structure in the optical depth with uh, waves? Well, they claim it was symmetric. Yeah, the, the key thing is symmetric. The key thing is, the key thing is symmetric. The key thing there is the claim. The claim is symmetric. Yeah, the it's symmetric is quite uh, not so significant. Look at the data. Yeah, so, so yes, <laughs> so, so they have moon there, symmetric. It's, there's some symmetry in this thing, but not, I mean, by my eyes, not so, so strong. So, but then the question you have to say, what is this? What is this, this thing? It's kind of strange. I mean, it's, I mean, it's not completely random comet falling. This thing is blocking a big part of the star. It's a big part of the star. It's blocked. It's blocked. Also, what's a cage, something other? There's another one, Eugene Chang would come with it. It's like this. Circumbinary. This is circum circumbinary planet. This one, yeah. ten years. The whole period, ten years. It's very uncertain. Also, this system. So. Do you need the disk itself to be massive, or could you have some shepherding? Oh, I haven't thought about you saying high. Yeah, what we are we are doing here is basically you have a a series of rings. You could say a series of moons talking to each other. So <laughs> that's what we're talking about. So you're, what you are saying is suppose I have a big moon here. Is it will help? We haven't considered that possibility actually. If you have a big moon, huge moon to produce that. You did? Did you do? No, not to, to eclipses, that the moon is holding the moon. things together in the orientation. Yeah, yeah, that maybe. Yeah, maybe you. So the has to be huge, right? Has to be huge. The mass is a, is a similar kind of things. So what we had, I think, the, the concept is very simple. We had this nice. I thought it's a clean problem with modified Laplace surface. I thought I like that. Yeah, and we can do some. Yeah. work in the opposite way. Like if you imagine this certain planetary disk embedded in this initial phase in the disk, yeah, material from the disk that's in the orbital plane coming in, but the self-gravity would actually stop you from tilting into the spin axis of the planet, closer to the planet? 
Like I understand. Yeah, how do you produce misalignment? That's a different, completely different question, right? In the case, you know, how do you produce misalignment? So in the case of Saturn, Saturn's ring, as far as I understand, correct me, <laughs> right? The ring is pretty small, all within the Laplace radius. So in a way, the ring, it's essentially a, it's an extension of the bulge, rotational bulge of the Saturn, right? So it's happy to be there. So what's happening there, it's that the whole thing get tilted, whole bulge and the ring get tilted by a resonance. The resonance occurs when the precession, nodal precession, the precession of the spin become comparable to one of these, one of these uh, vertical oscillation modes of the multi-planetary systems. That's what was happening. So here you have a big ring, which is already outside the Laplace surface. <laughs> How do you do it? It's a bit clear, unclear. So you can, you can, if it's brown dwarf, it may be OK. If it's low, if it's a brown dwarf, you can just say, well, they form that way. You know, you have a lot of mass. But when it's a planet, it's not so clear how you form these things. Uh, maybe it's possible. I, 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 you know, you can have some giant impact if you have a big enough everything. Everything just impacts things. Um, you can do these things. Um, so the formation is a different story. I haven't addressed.